Welcome back. And we are moving now into our conversation up on the UNCAC implementation. And here with us, we have two representatives who recently visited uh, Jamaica to learn a bit about the implementation process taking place there. Uh, two weeks ago, we were joined by the representatives of the private sector and uh, government representatives. And today, we're joined by a union representative uh, from the National Trade Union Congress of Belize, Hubert Enriquez, <coughs> and representing the Belize network of NGOs, Senator Osmani Salas. Good morning and Good morning. welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, you know, just tell us a little bit about what your experience was like um, in Jamaica for the exchange. Uh, <laughs> well, um, good morning once again. I want to say I'm, it's a pleasure to be here uh, to discuss this very important topic. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, um, as a member of the project board, uh, we were a part of the delegation <coughs> that went to Jamaica recently. Um, to look at what they're doing there. Um, in fact, it was a good country to go because Jamaica, they signed onto the convention since 2008. And so they have been some ways into the implementation of the convention as opposed to ourselves who signed up just last year. Um, but in fact, even before they signed onto the convention, they have done a several, several things. And um, one of the things that I was particularly interested in is this whole matter of uh, what happens at the office of the contractor general. And in fact, when we were there, um, we had split up ourselves in groups. And myself, I was assigned to, to, you know, to visit the office of construction. Actually, I, myself, I'm a construction economist. Mm -hmm. And so I'm particularly interested in looking at the procurement method that they've used there. And, um, and they have actually been some ways into that matter. In fact, the, the contractor general office in Jamaica is a very well respected office. Um, their surface has a, a staff of like 64 persons. And um, they're, they're, they, they deal with not only construction matters, they also deal with matters of non-construction, pro procurement matters. Um, so um, it was a very good experience for me. Um, I opened an ex I opened the experience. Actually, I've been in Jamaica before. I studied Jamaica already earlier. But they have, they have gone quite a, number, a long ways in, in, in implementing um, that matter. And, and now that they have moved so in printing the UNCAC uh, convention, there's going, there's going to be some changes um, in, in, in how, they, how they deal with matter of procurement. Yeah. But, um, but all in all, they have done pretty well in terms of contractual office. Yeah. Let, let's get your experience. Yes, I, I, I learned a lot from the experience. Um, I must say it was done as a part of the, of the project that UNDP has been, you know, has been supporting this year to to strengthen national capacities to implement UNCAC in Belize. So mm -hmm. th this was what you call a South, South exchange to learn from what a uh, you know, sister Caribbean nation has been doing. So I had the opportunity to visit with the Integrity Commission of Jamaica, mm -hmm. um, uh, with, with, the, with the senior staff of that commission. <coughs> Another highlight of my visit was a visit with the uh, Electoral Commission of Jamaica. Um, I, 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 personally consider that the highlight of my visit uh, because I learned a lot from the way they run uh, their, uh, you know, their electoral system in Jamaica. So we met with, the, with most of the commissioners, yeah. highly independent and very powerful body in Jamaica. And another highlight was our visit with National Integrity Action. That, that's, that's a civil society organization. So from our perspective at the Belize Network of NGOs, it was very important for us to see what CSOs have been doing in Jamaica. There's a long history yeah. with CSO involvement on corruption matters, anti-corruption campaigns in Jamaica. So we, we learned a lot from that. And you know, later on in the segment, uh, I, we hope to get the opportunity to talk about um, what we aim to do next month, where we hope to bring some Jamaicans to Belize to share their experiences yeah. with a Belize audience. Well, I, I think it's very critical for us to address uh, what has been ongoing since Belize has signed on to the UNCAC. There have been uh, quite a few criticisms coming out that mm -hmm. the process towards implementation doesn't seem to be as robust as uh, we had all hoped at the signing of mm -hmm. the convention itself. Now, you are representatives of this particular body at this point in time. Um, Tell us what your response is to people who are saying, listen, if we're serious about this, let's get moving. 
All right. Let, let, yeah, if you don't mind, let me start Sorry, off, uh, okay. Brother Hubert. Sorry, no, we all signed on to this convention, United Nations Convention Against Corruption, uh, uh, almost a year ago. Yeah. So this December 9th, I think, will mark a year. One year. Which is also when, when, the, world when the world celebrates International Anti-Corruption Day. Yeah. Um, but before I, I, I go into trying to respond to your question, Marlene, I, I must say that this is not the answer to dealing with corruption. This alone is not. This goes a long way to prepare countries, to put systems in place, do, do the necessary legal reform, right, legis right, legislative arrangements to, to combat corruption. Mm -hmm. But it, 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 it doesn't need to depend on this. Mm -hmm. This is supposed to help countries along the process. But now, how we combat corruption? It's, it's up to every single Belizean, mm -hmm. individually. We have a role to play. And I think this is a message we need to put forward. When we look at all the different examples of corruption, they are countless. Yeah. It starts with the person. It starts with what you allow to happen. It starts with what you see but don't report. It is in the private sector. It is in the public sector. It is in all facets of our society. Mm -hmm. So we could sign on to as many conventions as we want. Yeah. And that alone won't do it. So now, you know, talking about this convention, um, whilst in Jamaica, we completed what we call a self-assessment checklist, mm -hmm. which is a requirement under the convention for, for countries, in this case Belize, since we're one of the new signatories, to complete a self-assessment, which has been submitted to, to the Secretariat of the Convention, that will show them where we are in, in, in our, the objective yes, in our capacity of preparation to yeah. meet what this is. So we have yet to see uh, a synthesis of that self-assessment. Um, we, we, like, like all of us on the project board, with the exception of the government of, of the Attorney General's representatives, yeah. uh, who are the ones who completed the self-assessment, um, I'm, I'm still waiting for a report of, of a synthesis report of that because it is hundreds of pages, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, we're waiting for the results to see where we stand. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that is an important step in our implementation of this convention. As a follow-up to that. Um, I think two countries have already been selected to come and do an independent evaluation yeah, of, of the self-assessment, to, to like yeah. a verification. So essentially we're saying this is how far we are uh, from what meeting, are the meeting uh, some of the specific objectives yes, of yes, the yes. convention, whether in resources, uh, human resources, right. or in established systems. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't move away, and I hear what you're saying, you know, Ultimately, moral integrity would, would put aside the need for an uncut, but we live in Belize, and we have seen very blatant acts of corruption, and, and, and the, the signing of the country to this particular convention was, uh, there was a collective sigh of relief to say, we're doing something. And of course, we were warned then that it wouldn't be a panacea, it wouldn't be effective immediately, no longer corruption in the country. Um, but when people see that there's information exchange and all these other processes taking place, it can be viewed as perhaps a, a slow process. So let me get the union's perspective on, on this particular issue. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad you raised the issue, Marlene, because it really is a very important issue. Yeah. And indeed, several persons are asking us very <coughs> question. Yeah. That in fact, we've signed this convention and nothing has happened since then. Yeah. But I want to say that in fact, having signed the convention, the first thing we did was to find the funding. And in fact, we were lucky to have received a grant yeah. from the United Nations Development Program to commence the process because the government apparently didn't, even though they signed the convention, there was no funds allocated to deal with the matter. And so we were able to get a grant. And that grant has really meant that um, the, we were now we were able to set up a project board mm -hmm. comprising of the various representatives like myself and other persons, or NGOs and so forth. Um, but since then, there has been a series of activities. The board has met several, several times since then. And in fact, we've had um, a very robust seminar, a two-day seminar, in which officials from the uh, office in Panama, the regional office in Panama, came mm -hmm. down to Belize to so conduct training. And in fact, um, 
we, we did begin to speak about what were the gaps in our yeah. system to enable it to, to, to look at it. But we've also had, um, like for instance, we've had this also <laughs> exchange, mm -hmm. it's, it's really an information sharing gathering process. Um, we've also looked at, we've also had trainings, because in fact the Office of the United Nations, under the project we have also been able to conduct trainings mm -hmm. uh, locally at several universities and also um, also at, at, at primary as well as secondary schools. Mm -hmm. And so there's an ongoing process, but it does take time. And I want to quickly, if I may, Marley, just quickly mm -hmm. point out some of the things in the, in the convention, because really and truly, uh, people might in fact think that it's going to happen overnight. <laughs> but really and truly, because we have gotten to a stage where it's, take, it's taken a while to get to where we are right now, it is, in my, my opinion, going to take a while for us to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And we need to have the little patience and the, and the, and the, the fortitude to, to ha and have the will to get it, get it through. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's going to happen if, we, in fact, we have the determination. I want to point out quickly um, some of the things that I think the a very important preamble to the convention, which I think we have to, we have to spend some time to just quickly go through it, if you don't mind. Don't really hold it. No, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I think he knows better. I, 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 I don't think. I mean, I'm yeah. Very, very important provisions. But we should. We should yeah. access uh -huh. the convention. Yeah. Well, yes, what it says here is that the and these parties who actually signed this convention, this is the government, you know, they were very concerned about the seriousness of problems and threats posed by corruption to the stability and security of societies, undermining the institutions and values of democracy, ethical values and justice, and jeopardizing sustainable development and the rule of law. So concern also about the links between corruption and other forms of crime, in particular organized crime and economic crime, including money laundering, Concern further about the cases of corruption that involve vast quantities of assets, which may constitute a, co a substantial portion of the resources of states that threaten the political stability and sustainable development of those states. Convinced that corruption is no longer a local matter, but a transnational phenomenon that affects all societies and economies, making international cooperation to prevent and control it essential. So convinced also that a comprehensive and multidisciplinary approach is required to prevent and combat corruption effectively. Yeah. Convinced further that the availability of technical assistance can play an important role in enhancing the ability of states, including by strengthening capacity and by institutional building to prevent and combat corruption effectively. Convinced that the illicit acquisition of personal wealth can particularly da be damaging to democratic institutions, national economies, and the rule of law. So it goes on, but I mean, I'm just trying to set the background to yeah. which all these things happen. And fact, there uh, is that, an that overall be, uh, goal in, in, be, in what we are, uh, we are hoping will be achieved through the implementation process of mm. the UNCAC. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I want to talk about, obviously, you had the South to South exchange. And, and what's great about this is you visited a country like Jamaica, <coughs> Jamaica being a, a Caribbean nation like us, uh, some of the, the um, perhaps, um, cultural nuances are similar, the way we view things. Tell us about some of the um, progress that they have been able yeah. to make that you feel are easily achievable here in Belize. It is important for the anti-corruption bodies to be as independent as possible, mm. independent from political interference. Now, I'll use two specific examples. One is the Integrity Commission in Jamaica. The way the, 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 the commissioners are yeah. appointed is what we should aim to do in Belize. Yeah. The, Governor General, the Governor General of Jamaica has a lot of authority when it comes to um, appointing these commissioners. In their case, the, the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition need to agree. It's not on the advice of the Prime or Minister consultation. who consults with it. No. It, is, it has to be the agreement of both. If the Governor General cannot get their agreement, he has to look again. Mm -hmm. That is what we need in Belize. Mm -hmm. with the, with I, I thought so that, was, that was a great recommendation. Mm -hmm. That was a great uh, part of the information coming back from Jamaica because that is easily applicable here in Belize. Yes, yes. And, 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 um, you know, and they do their job. Look, the Integrity Commission has a staff. Mm -hmm. I, I must say that here in a... In a I think other than a secretary and an admin assistant, that's, that's all they have. So the commissioners themselves are then obligated to do the, the verification, the evaluation, and all of that. In, in Jamaica, they have 
a staff of highly trained and prepared people that do the job and a commissioner's vet. So that's another lesson learned yeah. that we could implement here. And, and yeah. how do we get there then? How do, how do we see one of those boards implemented? Well, it will take, um, I'm not sure if at the level of, of the constitution, but it will take amendments to yeah. legislation. Yeah. Yeah. It, will, it, it will mean that both major parties need to, need to, need to agree. Mm -hmm. And for that to happen, uh, the way I see it, Brother Hubert, is that we need, we need to put pressure. We need, we need to keep the pressure up for that change to happen. And that's um, a bit of a curiosity for me. What are your roles in seeing the um, success of UNCAC, your individual roles? Let, let, me, let me quickly say this, mm -hmm. that in addition to amending the, the laws to make it compliant with the UNCAC convention, what in my mind is more important because at the moment there are several laws which really are compliant. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't a matter of holding creating laws. It's a matter of looking after the enforcement of those laws. And that's where I think we have a weakness in our country. In fact, not that in our country, many countries. Mm -hmm. And so what this UNCAC is going to do then it, is that it's going to provide us with the resources, the technical assistance that's necessary yeah. to ensure that those laws are actually effectively implemented. Mm -hmm. And so what we will see happen then, what, what's going to be different is that in a sense, we're moving away from this whole matter of independence and sovereignty where we're going to get people from abroad to assist us yeah. in making sure, like, uh, let's see what happened in Jamaica, in, Niger, sorry, in Guatemala, mm -hmm. where the government, where actually prime, or the, the president was actually impeached mm -hmm. because of the fact that they had this anti-corruption regime there. Yeah. And they had an international um, a prosecutor mm -hmm. who was able to get the, 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 the prime minister, the, the, the president, to step down. And in fact, he's in jail right now, along with his, his vice president, he's in jail right now. Yeah, the previous president. Yeah. So yeah. we can see similar things happen here in Belize. And so I think uh, we want to warn our politicians that in fact, this is going to be a very, very serious move. And that in fact, um, they might want to skirt around it. But the fact that they've signed the convention now means that the international world is looking on Belize and we're going to have assistance. But, but that's that's where I think oftentimes <laughs> we become a bit skeptical. Mm -hmm. You visited the contractor general's office in Jamaica, and, and I'm interested to hear on that experience. We have a contractor general in Belize. We have internal mechanisms that are built in to be able to dissuade or to somehow uh, limit the possibilities as to corrupt practices that may take place, whether it's kickbacks, whether it's proper tendering process, uh, clear submissions of bids, clear rev revision of bids, and the entire transparent process that should take place there. But even with these mechanisms in place, while we may, we, we hear, or oftentimes we are able to access, access information where the, the processes do not legitimately take place. You see, it has to do with the independence of these offices and also for them to have the resources they need to do, the, to, to do their jobs. The example of the Integrity Commission is a, is a case in yeah. point. You have commissioners, and yet the way they're appointed leaves a whole lot to be desired. It is, no, it is, it is heavily weighed on the ruling party's yeah. favor. It, they essentially become political appointments. Essentially, that's what it is. So we already start wrong. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Um, it's not about the members. It's, it's not about the members. Yeah. It's yeah. A, exactly. Yeah. So, so I hope. Um, that, that, that the members listening right now realize that that's what we're talking about. No, no but that is the point. We, yeah. we need to be able to have these conversations, conversations without yes. people feeling that yes, it's a yes, personal yes, yes. attack. There is nothing wrong with someone being aligned with a political party. Yeah. There is a difference if that alignment in a particular role yes, yes. will skew their judgment. The Electoral Commission, though, if I could very quickly right, share a little bit about that, is another very good case in point. In Jamaica, it's, it's an independent commission. Mm -hmm. Their own staff. In Belize, we effectively have two electoral management bodies, you know. Mm -hmm. We have the Elections and Boundaries. Uh, Election and Boundaries Commission and the department. And they are vague areas as to what their roles are. In Jamaica, it's one. Yeah. It's one. They, we, we know that we read about early corruption in Jamaica. So they're yeah. far from being <laughs> a perfect society. However, they're starting to put the systems. The last elections in Jamaica, I believe the ruling party won by 200 votes, mm -hmm. one or two seats, and the losing party accepted the results. When we heard years ago in Jamaica, there were riots, mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. were, it shows me that this, that this new reform system is working. 
and the commissioners are highly respected. And there's a level let, let of let trust. Me ask, let me ask about the autonomy of, of the commission there, for example, because it, you're talking about two totally different population sizes, for oh, sure. Yes, and that, that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, perhaps it's it's easier to to be seen as independent from political alignment because there's more there's a larger population. Is that the case <laughs> or it or is it similar to the integrity commission in Jamaica where there has to be proven um, non-alignment to political parties to be able to run the election commission. We had this issue when the chairman of a political party is also in charge of the elections or, or uh, the, yeah, the election yeah. commissioner and, and there's a clear conflict of interest. But should one's personal judgment be uh, trusted in a post like that? And, and how did you find the, the commission being established in, there? In, in, uh, in Jamaica, the, the governor general, again, a very important role. The governor general appoints, and it needs to be in the agreement, with the agreement of both prime minister and leader of the opposition. The, the, the parties, the major parties there, appoint um, a couple as well. So, but it, the, the numbers are weighed in favor of, of the independent commissioners mm -hmm. that are appointed by the governor general and amongst themselves they choose a chairperson a chairman mm -hmm. and 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 they decide who will be the yeah. chief elections officer as well who himself in the, in in their case is a commissioner yeah well but they have both systems they have together. both systems yeah. together well i, I think you raised a, a good question there marlene regarding the independence of these autonomous bodies and if in fact there is a, because one of the questions that we always have is the question of whether or not we have weak institutions, or it is that we have weak persons in institutions. And many times we find that in fact what we have really are weak persons in institutions. So there's a need to really strengthen those aspects, the institutions themselves, to make them stronger, mm -hmm. as well as to look at the me <coughs> mechanisms to ensure those persons who are, who are heads of institutions have the necessary capacity and the strength for them to be able to react. I'm not, for instance, impressed with the, it, it's our Office of Contractor General here, but the guy is my personal friend. Mm -hmm. But I think that there much more could be done with that office to ensure that, in fact, things are things, 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 things are on the road. Yeah. Now, one of the big things um, that I was able to discern from, from my visit to Jamaica, in fact, not only Jamaica, I have also visited other countries, like for instance. But a big aspect of this whole matter, really and truly, particularly in Belize, in fact, other countries too, is this whole matter of public procurement. This is where the free thing happens in government. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it happens. Um, because it's a part of a process in which uh, monies are generated for political purposes. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is that um, there are persons who are perhaps political cronies who get all the contracts from government. And those contracts are then uh, turned over and so a, a portion of the funds go back to the political party to campaign. To, to campaign for campaign financing. And so one of the good things that's going to come out of this whole matter is to, is to look at that whole matter of procurement and as well as um, campaign financing. That's a, that's a big aspect of the UNCAC. Yeah. You know, and so when, when finally this thing is coming come into effect, those matters are going to be addressed um, so that political parties are, for instance, registered and they actually have a, uh, uh, their accounts and audit, audit and so forth, and also the matter of procurement is dealt with. Let me ask what their process is in terms of campaign um, financing and declaration of assets. In Belize, thankfully, we're finally at the point where uh, perhaps we, we are enforcing, and even though there's lots of criticism about when it will start, um, de declaring your funds as a member of uh, as as a um, member of government, whether you're running for office, so whether you're in the Senate, yeah. yeah, and knowing exactly where these funds come from is one way in being able to recognize if you are profiting from being in public office. Um, but it's been very difficult to, to enforce in Belize, and we have the law for it. So tell me a bit about what's happening in Jamaica when it comes to declaring your public assets, your, I mean your, your personal assets. Well, in Jamaica, the Integrity Commission looks after the parliamentarians. Yeah. And there's another body, I forget its name, yeah. that, 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 um, what, do you recall it? I don't know the name, I know there's another body indeed. But they look after all, pol all public Public officers, officers. Oh, okay. which are twenty-four thousand plus. Mm. So oh. they are they, you know, they, they mm -hmm. have both covered. So mm -hmm. you, you imagine how busy they all are. But mm -hmm. with the parliamentarians, um, they they are required, like like myself in, mm -hmm. in the case here in Belize, to file our 
or financial declarations mm -hmm. um, on time. Um, our main difference is that I, I think here in Belize, they give us a three months for the grace period to, to, to submit. And if we don't, then the delinquents, the names of delinquents are then sent to mm -hmm. the, to the um, DPP, mm -hmm. Director of Public Prosecutions. Yeah. In Jamaica, there's no grace period, mm -hmm. but they work with you. What I found interesting is that they work with you from the moment you're elected as a parliamentarian. Right after elections, the, the uh, Integrated Commission meets with all parliamentarians and effectively tells them, these are yeah. your responsibilities. We are here not to deny you, but yeah. to help you meet your or obligations. Or this is your requirement mm -hmm. in yes. assuming this public office. And if they don't submit on time, they call them. Yeah. But what they do, and I found very interesting, which is different to what happens here, they advise the four, the four political leaders, if I could call it that, the Prime Minister, Mm -hmm. the leader of the opposition, the president of the Senate, and the speaker of the House, and tell them, these have not filed yet. Please talk to your people. Mm -hmm. Here, the Integrity Commission just reports to the prime minister, right? Mm -hmm. But there, they work with you. It, it's, it's a process, and they have very few delinquents, and they publish their annual reports. I think this one hasn't been around enough to have an annual report yeah. out yet, so I'm looking forward to seeing one from them. In Jamaica, they have their annual reports. Everything is there. Yeah. Who filed, when they filed, who's delinquent, who, which list was sent to the DPP, etc. Yeah. It, it's very open, it's very transparent. So, so let's come back to the public service uh, portion. And of course, as a representative of the union, the PSU is, is very important in um, working with public servants so that, uh, or government workers, so that they also understand they have a role in stopping corruption. Mm -hmm. What the Senate inquiry has shown us very <coughs> clearly is that not only could it be seen that there was interference from persons in public office, but it was really the very government workers who facilitated, perhaps they're saying out of intimidation. Um, so it shows that even if the mechanism's in place, the public service <coughs> must be strong enough to be able to say, no, this is not within um, my job description to be able to do this, or this is not how we are regulated to be able to do uh, the work that we do. Yeah, well, I, I do accept that indeed uh, there is much to work to be done <coughs> uh, to build the capacity uh, of public officers. Uh, it is that uh, the morale right now at the public service is at an all time low. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it is uh, quite convenient for political persons. They like it that way, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. they, they have actually ensured that in fact it is the way it is because they have dominated and they have actually been able to do mm -hmm. what they want to do. And that's why in this project, I, uh, what, what, what was um, very comforting to me is the fact that we are now engaged in a process looking at it in the sense of building individual capacity. I, I, I will talk about quickly what happened recently because recently what we had is a our experts who came from, from Panama to mm -hmm. assist in training of young, young children um, in terms of values, uh, in terms of looking at things of like responsibility oh, wow. and integrity okay. and honesty and so forth. Mm -hmm. It has to start from there. Mm -hmm. We'll we build individual um, capacity to be able to look at these things from a, from a, from a, from a holistic perspective, mm -hmm. to build character and integrity. Those are what we want to have, have to nurture from yeah. a very, very young age. Uh, because it, it is true that, in fact, um, at the level of civil servants and other levels, you know, they're, they're, that's where we're lacking. Yeah. You know, uh, the laws could be there, but if the individuals are not um, up to it, then yeah. we really have a problem. You and know? a very important law that we need to put in place, or, you know, strengthen here in Belize, is to protect whistleblowers, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, we, you know, people need to f know they have the. It's the, a fair victimization the, yeah. that holds yes. people. Yes. Back. That needs yeah. to be addressed so that people can speak out. I'm pretty sure there are many out there who would love to speak out. Yeah. But don't out of fear. Yeah. Fear of, as you said, fear of victimization. It yeah. exists. Mm -hmm. I personally have experienced a case <laughs> personally. <laughs> I, I think many of us have. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how much more time we have, Barney, well, but I wanted point. to very briefly t um, talk about two events coming up. Um, okay. Well, we are still moving towards the anniversary of, of yes. the signing, uh, the first anniversary. Um, before, before we talk about the specific activities there, yeah. the mm -hmm. formulation of this particular group uh, who's working on, on the national strengthening mm -hmm. uh, as we lead into the implementation, what's, what's the longevity of this group and how far will you be involved 
in terms of carrying out the process? It's indefinite for now, no. I mean, we, we haven't set a completion date. It's, it's continuing next year with okay. the new funding that we have received from the U.S. Embassy's currency initiative. Okay. So UNDP funding ends next month mm -hmm. and, and the currency funding kicks in okay. to continue the Im implementation process. Yeah, it takes, it takes a while because um, really and truly uh, it is supposed to, well, the first person is supposed to, it is said that uh, you don't expect anything to happen within two years. For two years. No? So we've done one year already and so next year we're hoping that in fact by next year we'll be able to start the process. What happens is that um, there are periods, there, there are what they call um, review processes and mm -hmm. believes will be subject to review next year, mm -hmm. the first review, and, and first the aspect has, the UNCAC has covers four, four major areas: one, criminalization, um, prevention; it has the asset recovery, asset recovery; it has also international cooperation. And so we, we will be actually be judged or assessed on two areas: the first two areas um, mm -hmm. within the next year or so. And so after that, we have, we have to then have the other year to cover. And there'll be, there'll be countries coming in to Belize to review Belize and to assess Belize as to how far, how far we yeah. are. And during that process, the board has to be here uh, to, to, to assist in making sure that, in fact, what should happen happens. You know, mm -hmm. like for instance, um, uh, next month, uh, it's going to be the countries that have been selected, just Haiti and Tuvalu, will be coming to Belize to, to look at what we've done so far and to assist mm -hmm. and, to, and to make a recommendation. And then they're going to make a report what, where we are and how we are. And, and, and the, the board has to be involved in that process to ensure that it guides the process. We had no choice in the selection of the yeah, functions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, I don't, uh, I well, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I know what you're thinking. <laughs> and we take away. The, the, but, but the but persons let me, let me who will say, come. Because I don't want to be, like, there's, no, there's no point in unspoken words on TV. <laughs> but when you say Haiti, yeah. you yeah, say, yeah, well, yeah. we're talking about corruption. I thought the same. Yeah. Yeah. I thought the same. But, but, but I, I took comfort in the, in the fact that the individual who will be coming are, are experts in the UNCAC process. Okay. You're right? Yeah. So, so it's not yeah. right necessarily a government, a Haitian government yeah. representative that will yeah. come. And so from the exchange, I'm assuming that you come back and you are able to put together recommendations for what we're doing here in Belize. Mm -hmm. What are some of your recommendations and do you believe that they will be um, considered yeah, it's, it's a good question, and, and it gives me the opportunity to very briefly say that the composition of the project board mm -hmm. is, is, is good, I would say. Yeah. I mean, we, we have the trade union representation, we have CSO representation through the NGOs, the, the business community, the opposition parties represented, unfortunately, um, the representative who joined us this morning, and, and then you have the different government agencies represented. Yeah. The, the focal point for UNCAC is the Attorney General yes. and his ministry. So we have an opportunity as CSO representatives mm -hmm. to push our case, mm -hmm. to present our ideas, and to lobby for recommendations. I personally have already submitted recommendations out of the Jamaica exchange. Yes, yeah. uh, you know, specifically like some of the ones that we have discussed mm -hmm. this morning. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we, we just can't leave it there. Mm -hmm. We have to continue pressing, being, being represented at these important meetings, and push for our own activities. Yeah. Like, the events next next month, but Go we ahead, have to do our part. Let me tell you, it's not, not all being all that good. I mean, mm -hmm. in the board meeting itself, there, we have been having oh, yes. fights. Oh, yeah. fight oh, yes. itself. Like for oh, instance, yes. recently, when the government actually sent out that a step, a step without consulting ourselves, we made a big, big noise about mm -hmm. it, and we made a stick about it. They <laughs> had, when they sent out the actually, they, 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 we had a process where there was a self-assessment self that needed to be sent off, mm -hmm. and it was done without our consultation. Mm -hmm. They did mm -hmm. it on their own, and so we made sure. Listen, we made that a noise about the matter, and so they know now that in fact we're very serious, and they can't do that kind of nonsense anymore. No? Yeah. In Jamaica, we yeah. learned that the that the government involved CSOs from the start yeah. of mm -hmm. the process. So. These are lessons learned that we, we must yeah, consider here. And, and, and I appreciate what, what Hubert is saying in terms of not just sitting by quietly as well, because it, it can be very simple <laughs> to the consultation process that yeah, we talk yeah, about, yeah, which yeah, is yeah, yeah. whether you like my decision or not, this is what I, uh, I'm going to do. But let's, let's hear about your activities to commemorate uh, <laughs> yes, the exactly. one year anniversary <laughs> and the, the World Day uh, on Anti-Corruption. World Anti-Corruption Day. Yeah. I think it's what it's called. December 9th. Okay. But we're kicking it off this coming Monday mm -hmm. with a panel discussion in Belmopan. Okay. Um, it will be from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Okay. 
we will announce at that, uh, at that event the winners of the essay contest, okay. the secondary and tertiary students, and the jingle contest. We're trying to come up with a jingle for the implementation yeah. process <laughs> for ONCAT. And then we'll have a panel discussion featuring our Attorney General, Honorable Perifit, Michael Perifit. The, the resident representative for UNDP will also be, mm -hmm. be a part of the panel, Mr. Christian Salazar Volkman and the Governance and Peace Building Cluster Leader for the UNDP Latin American Caribbean Hub, Mr. Gerardo Noto, and our very own, my very own colleague from the Senate, Senator Elena Smith, will also be a panelist as the president of the BNTU and representing the unions in the Senate. No? So those are the four panelists. There will be an opportunity for, for Q&A, okay. for questions and answers. Yeah, short and sweet, but I, I think everyone should make an effort to attend. Yeah. Uh, we, we learn a lot about where we are in, in the process yeah. and what the expectations are. Then the following week, December 12th, mm -hmm. or 11th, December 11th, sorry, Monday, so exactly a week later, in the Belize Network of NGOs, with, with the strong support from our trade union part, you know, uh, trade union colleagues, will sponsor a national symposium on corruption. Um, that will be an all day event and we are still, I, I can't announce the names yet of who will be the panelists because we're still working at finalizing a few. Mm -hmm. But it seems very likely that we will get um, the senior anti-corruption officer from Botswana to oh, attend. Yeah. They have, we are, and, and you know, Brother Hubert can speak more about this because he, he's familiar with their work, but yeah. they, they have done a lot there. And we want to hear from that experience. And we also want to bring one or two from Jamaica the, it might not happen for this symposium, but later that week, uh, we'll have Professor Trevor Monroe from National Integrity Action Jamaica to, to have a round table with, with NGOs and CSOs mm -hmm. in, in Belize later that week. But at the National Symposium, we'll again have um, our Attorney General mm -hmm. open the symposium. Um, um, we're hoping that we have members of the delegation that went to Jamaica to mm -hmm. talk about their experience. Um, and so one panel will be on the status of UNCAC implementation in Belize. The other panel will be on learning from the Botswana and Jamaica experience. The final panel will be where do we go from here. Yeah. And that will be led by, again, um, a number of people that we'll announce during the course of next week. Yeah. And we'll wrap it up with a closing session from the Attorney General mm -hmm. as far as the way forward. So mm -hmm. th that is one of the ways that we can keep the topic alive mm -hmm. so that the public is aware and, 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 and we know there is a process. It will take some time, as Brother Hubert has said, but we, we need for the Belizeans to be informed along the way. Yeah. Yeah. So there's also uh, a mental shift that has to take place yes, as yes, well. Yes, yes. Uh, let me just quickly point out that I believe that if, in fact, we get the person from Botswana to come to Belize to assist us in this process, it will be a very good thing. I have lived in Botswana, worked in Botswana for a number of years as, a, as, a, as a, in fact, a, an expat. And my experience there has been re it is really, really mind-boggling mind, mind and blowing. I mean, I've, I've learned, um, it's the first country that I've been to in which uh, they have paid particular attention to how we're going to curb corruption. Mm -hmm. In fact, they have done a number of things, including decentralizing uh, government. Um, they have introduced an office that's called the a Directorate of Corruption and Economic Crimes. Mm -hmm. And that office really is fair in, in, in Botswana. Uh, when they come to visit you, it's because they have, found, they have, they have already known they have all the that there are certain things that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and so it would be good to have that person come to Belize to share some of those experiences because the country has really, really not, not benefited. Um, uh, and they, they're now being known as the country as the least corrupt country in Africa. You know, um, when they got independence in 1966, it was, a, it was perhaps the third poorest country in the entire world. Mm -hmm. And they have now moved up. Okay. Um, and they have now, they, they, it, it, it's, it's a really um, uh, a thriving economy. And people have benefited from the fact that they have actually been able to, to secure their resources yeah. through, non, through, the, through, through, a, through a combination of methods which includes yeah. um, uh, anti-corruption measures. So. And in truth and fact, that is the ultimate goal in yeah, fighting yeah. corruption, that the resources go to where it's needed yeah, and yeah, to the yeah, people yeah, yeah. who I need to benefit them. from it, yeah, yes. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So I think that that, that is uh, definitely a goal we, we 
all would like to see us work I, on and take more I seriously. Don't know Belize has resources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't, I've said, I've said on social media, and I'll say it now. We, well, we what you say on social we, media? We, can't, yeah. we, can't, we, shouldn't, we can't call ourselves a poor country. No. We yeah. find tens or hundreds of millions of dollars when we have to pay. All right? We need bonnies of that magnitude to yeah. go where they need to go yeah. for the development of our nation. We have so many needs. But I think the danger in saying we're not a poor country is that you, you, we need to give a voice to the almost half of the of population course, no, no. Yeah. living yeah, yeah, in no, poverty. No. Right. And, you know, it's a, it's a great segue, and, and I know we're totally off topic <laughs> now, uh, but, but speaking of the recent ruling from the CCJ, obviously as a, as a senator, uh, you will most likely have a say in it later on, and as the union, we're looking forward to, to hearing um, what people have to say. What are your initial uh, reactions based on the ruling and the subsequent um, proposed courses of action, which is not yeah. to pay? I've read the ruling once. Mm -hmm. I will read it again, mm -hmm. and probably a third time, um, to understand exactly uh, what, what, what the implications of the order mm -hmm. orders are. Um, I, I won't speak as to what my vote will be yet. I, I need to consult with, 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 with our BNN network. Yeah. But I will say that, like most Belizeans, it, it angers me where we are right now. It, it angers me uh, um, about, about the political decisions that have been made past and present. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that it, if we could go back in time, that we could, we could right these wrongs. Wrong decisions have been made, and it's costing us dearly. But as far as, um, and, and yes, we know it needs to go to the National Assembly for, for the government to get to have the authority to, to pay mm -hmm. and to disperse. But, uh, we will see. It will be a very interesting debate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, very much so. My, my take on it is, the, well, I'm, I'm not surprised. I think from quite a while ago, the, the very court had actually ruled and in fact said that in Belize, there is prime ministerial governance and there's a lack of check and balances. And so this, in my mind, fits into that, that category. And it's a, it's a crying shame because of the fact that we've known this for quite a while, a while now. The present administration really came to power on the, on the basis of anti-corruption and reform measures. And they have been a sore disappointment when it comes to actually implementing some of these reform measures. So the very things that happened many years ago, it, it, it is useless to cry that in fact it happened years ago. You're now in power right now. You have, to, you, are, you have power to do things right now. And you have not done it. And so in my mind, I find it, I find it despicable to be talking about what happened then, when in fact you have the power now to do things and you have not done things that you said you were going to do. You know, so I put it squarely on the... On the, on the, on the, on the on the heels of the administration and its power right now to, to have us in a situation where years ago there was this debt which, have now, which has now grown more than double and yet um, you know, we have not put the measures in place to ensure that in fact that would not have happened. You know, that, and it angers me and it should anger every Belizean that we use foreign the way we have used foreign aid. We have had the opportunity to wisely invest that aid. Mm -hmm. And we have made some horrible decisions. Mm -hmm. And I know we're totally out of time, but Singapore is a good case of how they use their foreign aid. They invested it, and from being one of the poorest countries in the world in the 60s, they're yeah. one of the wealthiest. Mm -hmm. But they invested. They looked forward. They looked beyond. And they dealt with corruption from the start. Yeah. So yeah. we have a long way so to go, and we'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so we are hopeful that, in fact, with this whole implementation of UNCAC, that some of these things are, are really going to be addressed and that it's going to take a little time, yes, but, uh, but down the road, if we have the patience and the fortitude, it's going to happen and it's going to take a little while and with new generation of people coming, different thinking and so forth, yeah. that there's going to be um, some hope of Belize down the road. All right, well, thank you for coming in. Thank you for also responding to that, that question as well. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, and of course, we will keep on waiting to hear more information coming out from this body and especially uh, what happens in terms of the implementation of UNCAF. We have to go ahead now and take our final break and when we come back we'll have our wrap up so stay tuned.